Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Politics and Prose. I'm, I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of the bookstore, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be welcoming back to uh, PNP Richard uh, Russo. Uh, he's, uh, yeah, we can have some applause. Yeah. Uh, he, of course, he's here to talk about his, his latest novel, Somebody's Fool, the third in the North uh, Bath trilogy following Nobody's Fool and, and Everybody's Fool. Um, Rick has had one of those very successful and very long careers that are hard to sum up in a, in a brief introduction. Uh, but ju just to recite a, a few numbers, he's written 10 novels, a memoir, enough short stories to fill two published collections, um, and a bunch of essays and screenplays. Um, Awards-wise, uh, he, he won a Pulitzer in uh, 2002 for Empire Falls, and then France's American Literature Grand Prize in 2017 for Everybody's Fool. Uh, plus, uh, for a time, he taught literature uh, at, uh, at Colby College in, in Maine. Uh, but those, those plain facts really uh, don't do uh, justice to, uh, to, uh, to, to Rick. Uh, he's, he's truly a, a statesman of American letters, as, as he's been called. He was widely respected for his portrayals of, um, of life in small town America, particularly the declining mill towns of uh, the American Northeast. Uh, further enriching his works uh, has been their embrace of the humorous as well as the, the sentimental and the presence in them of characters with with foibles and frailties, characters who struggle to understand uh, what they what they really want out of life. Uh, Rick himself has observed that a cautious, uh, hard-won optimism infuses much of, of his fiction. And Ron Charles in the Washington Post recently observed that, uh, that Rick has become our national priest of masculine despair and redemption. Did you bring a collar tonight? Did you bring a collar? <laughs> Uh, among independent booksellers, I must say, you know, Rick is especially popular, uh, not only because he's a staunch defender of Indies, uh, but one of his daughters, Emily, is actually one of us, uh, having worked in, a, uh, I think, a couple of independent bookstores before coming to own one herself in, in Maine, where she and her sister and her parents uh, reside. And Rick also served as a leader of the Authors Guild and is is, is, is generally known in the business as a uh, very generous, heart in the right place, hard working kind of guy. Uh, he doesn't need my help this evening in uh, telling you all uh, here what his new book is about, so I'm gonna, gonna leave that to him. I will say that while Sully Sullivan, of course the main character of, of the first two books in the series, has died at the start of the third, um, Sully's still mentioned frequently, uh, uh, and much much of the rest of the of the popular cast is is reprised. Uh, still, North Bath itself is ceasing to exist. Uh, it's getting annexed by a wealthier town down the road, and of course, there's a corpse because well, what's a small town drama without one? Um, anyway, reviewers have had a lot to say um, that's uh, that's uh, very positive about uh, somebody's fool uh, complimenting. Rick, for, um, uh, for writing another engaging, insightful, deftly told story. Publishers Weekly said the book delivers the generous humor, keen ear for dialogue, and deep appreciation for humanity's foibles that have endeared uh, the author to his readers for decades. And the New York Times declared Rick has saved his best for last. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Richard Russo. What a lovely introduction. Thank you. Um, wonderful to be back at Politics and Prose. I thought I'd begin tonight with just with a moment of context. The first time I read here, I had a full head of dark brown hair. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm gonna to try to keep this reading um, short tonight. Um, at the beginning of the novel, Sully's son, Peter, um, has been um, 
teaching uh, in adjunct fashion in New York City. Uh, that is having three or four or five different jobs, a course here, a course there. Um, while his son, Will, um, has been um, finishing up his undergraduate work at Penn, after, after which he intends to um, put Bat North Bath, New York in his rearview mirror. Um, so I'm going to start off with that's, that's all you need to know to understand uh, this section that I'm going to read. In April, three weeks before R Will was set to graduate from Penn, Peter had gotten a call from Ruth his father's longtime paramour, the call that he had been dreading. His father had been in an accident, she informed him. No, oh, he wasn't injured, but he did total his truck and surprise, surprise, alcohol had been involved. And because this was his third accident in two years, wait, what, there were two others? His license was being revoked, which meant that he could no longer make his usual rounds to Hattie's, the donut shop, the OTB, the horse. You're telling me he needs a keeper, Peter said. No, Ruth said, bristling. I'm telling you he needs his son. Yeah, well, Peter said, also bristling. There were times when, as a kid, when I needed him, and where was he? Two words, Ruth told him. Grow up. Though this crisp advice, if that's what it was, had stung, it wasn't exactly unexpected. How many times over the years had he watched this same woman turn both barrels on his father and pull the trigger? Anyway, what would be the point of getting pissed off at her? It wasn't Ruth's fault that Peter had waited too long to fly the coop, and if he was honest, he probably wouldn't have lasted that much longer in New York anyway. Rising rents were quickly making the, the itinerant adjunct, adjunct, adjunct life which had been crappy to begin with, unsustainable. And while it was true that his father hadn't been around much when he was growing up, it was Sully who had thrown him that, that rope long ago, that long ago Thanksgiving when he had slunk back into town, his marriage in tatters, and no idea what to do next. Worse, after grabbing that rope, he had unjustly resented Sully for the loss of the academic life that he himself had so royally messed up. So. He called Ruth back the next morning and told her that he would wrap things up in the city and return as soon as he could to North Bath. Do me a favor, though. Don't tell him I'm coming. Okay, Ruth said. Mind telling me why? I do, actually, he said. Because for one thing, returning to North Bath would have a lot of moving parts, finishing his classes, turning in grades, severing ties with the various institutions where he had been teaching, renting a van to transport the stuff that he had accumulated in the city, saying his goodbyes. Who knew how long that would take? More importantly, he was going to need time to come to terms with his decision, and he didn't want to arrive back in North Bath nursing a sense of grievance, resentful of the choice that he himself was freely making. To his surprise, things had gone more smoothly than he would have predicted, and it was less than a month later when he sauntered into Hattie's, and slid onto the empty stool at the counter next to his father, who, absorbed in the newspaper's sporting page, sports page, didn't immediately notice him. It hadn't been that long ago, only since Christmas, since Peter had seen him, but in the intervening months, it had seemed that the man had segued into advanced old age, his hair and wiry stubble mostly gray, his eyes roomy. Finally noticing who now occupied the adjacent stool, Sully folded the no newspaper, sat it on the counter, and said, you're just in time. You can give me a, lo you can give me a lift out to Rub's place. If, if this hadn't been his father he was talking to, Peter might well have concluded that Ruth had broken her promise and alerted, Sully, alerted her to the fact that Sully's arrival was imminent. But no, this was just his father's way. One of the many maddening things about Sully was that he seemed not to fully believe in the world beyond Schuyler County. Despite Peter's absence, he didn't truly accept that his son had moved away and now lived in New York. Somehow he had been here, he'd been right here this whole time, and they just hadn't crossed paths. And now here he was, which proved him right. Therefore, no hello, no long time no see, just... Here you are. Good. I got a job for you. 
You remember Rub's wife, Bootsy, Sully was saying? She died last week, did you hear? I don't think it made the New York papers dead. She had a coronary getting out of the tub, uh, getting out of the bathtub, Sully said. Peter remembered her, an enormous woman, 300 pounds at least. His father read his thought. I know, how'd she get into the tub in the first place? <laughs> That's not what I was thinking, Peter lied. Sure it was, Sully said. You want to know what else you were thinking? No, what? That she must have made one hell of a racket when she went down. <laughs> Which was true. Peter had been thinking exactly that. Sully was now putting some bills on top of the check so that they could leave. You mind if I have a cup of coffee first? Peter said. Janie, Ruth's daughter, who now owned the place, had seen him come in and was already pouring in one. Look who's here. Sully instructed, instructed her, finally displaying muted surprise at Sully's, at Peter's unexpected materi unexpectedly materializing on the stool next to him. Janie set down a steaming cup of coffee and nodded. My personal favorite of all your children, she said, deadpan. Doctoring his coffee, Peter said, so has the, has the funeral happened? Yesterday. Poor Rub, Peter said. He had always felt bad for the man, hapless as he was, a defenseless target of Sully's relentless rib ribbing. How's he doing? Sully's fa um, his, father sh his father shrugged. How would you be doing? Again, Peter pictured the, the woman in question, and again his father read his thought. She was actually pretty nice when you got to know her, Sully offered. I don't doubt it, Peter said. And being married to Rub can't have been easy, Sully added. <laughs> you would know, Peter grinned. Because if, if Rub had been married to anybody for these last 30 years, it was to Sully. Most nights he didn't go home to Bootsy until, until Sully told him to. Sully was studying him now, apparently ready finally to address the fact of his presence. Okay, he said, what gives? As in, as in, why are you here? Peter took a sip of coffee. He was, he realized, enjoying this. I live here, he said. Since when? Not long, a couple days. They're not here exactly. I rented an apartment in Schuyler. Sully scratched his stubble thoughtfully. Why? I like it there. There's a lot going on. I might want to go to a movie or hear some live music. He lowered his voice. Get a decent cup of coffee. Yeah, but you could live in Miss Burroughs for free, his father pointed out, which never failed to make Peter smile. His father had owned the house for two decades. Besides, compared to Brooklyn, this, the place I rented is practically free. Well, suit yourself, Sully conceded. I'm just saying. There's nobody in the upstairs flat. It's yours if you want it. Or if you, wanted the, if you want the downstairs, I could move up back up there. It makes no difference to me. Except it did matter, Peter knew. He'd moved downstairs reluctantly because, because the stairs had become too much for him. No, I'll be fine in Schuyler, Peter assured him. Because I, I, besides, I already signed the lease. Sully nodded at him, suspicious now. What changed your mind? I seem to recall you saying that after Will went off to grad school, you were done with this place. I was, Peter said, but then I heard you might need a chauffeur. Right. Somebody told you about my little accident? Well, I heard you had one, Peter said. What happened? Sully paused, contemplating. Peter suspect, uh, con con contemplating, Peter suspected, how best to make something that would only happen to Sully seem like it could happen to anybody. You know how the parking lot out back of the horse slopes down towards the woods, he said. Peter pictured it in his mind's eye. Come on, said, there are concrete barriers. Um, there are concrete barriers. Yeah, they tell me I went over the, one of those, Sully said. You didn't see it? I was facing the other direction, Sully explained. Peter tried to make this work in his head. That would mean the vehicle was in reverse? Well, that's how I figure it, Sully admitted. It would explain why the ass end of my truck was what hit the tree. Peter massaged his temples. Jesus. 
What? Sully said, you've never made a mistake? How about right now? Peter wanted to say, coming back here, letting myself get sucked back into Sully world with these qualify as mistakes. Okay, so you're here, Sully continued. What are you planning to do for work? Teach, Peter said. Where? SCCC. Peter had heard about it, the just posted opening when he called his friend at Edison College to see if his old job, if there was any chance of getting his old job back. For this other position at the community college, being full-time and providing benefit, benefits was better. I'm the new chair of the English department, actually, he said. <laughs> Sully said, that would, that would have pleased your mother. No, Peter said, being named chair of the English department at Yale would have pleased my mother. So how come you didn't tell me about all this? How come you didn't tell me about the accident, Peter said. Having no ready answer, Sully took out a couple of additional dollar bills for Peter's coffee and tossed them on top of his check. Janie came back down the counter. Down the counter. Two Sullivans now, she said. God help us. Sully slid off his stool. Tell your mother I want to have a word with her, he said, specifically about that big mouth of hers. I'll tell her, but I don't see it well ending for I don't see it ending well for you, Janie said. She raised a questioning eyebrow at Peter, who agreed with her wholeheartedly. Out front, Sully scanned the cars parked at the curb for one that might belong to his son. This one here, Peter told him, electronically unlocking the Audi A6 that he had paid too much for at the used car lot in Schuyler a couple of days earlier. His father got in, surveyed the car's interior, moved the passenger seat back so that he could stretch out his bum knee. I went to war with Germany, you know. <laughs> yeah, Peter said, turning his head, turning his key in the ignition. Who won? I did, his father told him as the Audi's engine sprung into throaty life. It was nip and tuck there for a while, though. Eighteen months. Neither of them knew it, of course, but that was the amount of time remaining to them. 18 months before Peter would walk into Hattie's one morning and Janie would inform him that Sully had gotten tired of waiting for him and had limped up the street to the OTB to bet on his daily trifecta. Peter found him sitting on the bench outside, studying the racing form. Or that's what he'd apparently been doing when his heart quit. Thank you. Um, well, I don't want to say too much uh, about this book. I think the interesting part is going to be the questions that you have for me. But um, this is my this is my third stop um, on on a month long book tour thereabouts. Um, and um, of course, one of the things that everybody wants wants to know is why go back to why go back to North Bath one more time? I mean, it took it was over two decades. Um, between Nobody's Fool and Somebody's Fool. I had no intention ever of writing a, um, a sequel to Nobody's Fool or any other novel of mine. Um, they just all seemed like standalones. And you know, the difficulty of, if, if, if the book is good, if any, any book that you've written, if it's good, there's a kind of sense of finality to it when you, you, know, you, you, you finish it and your characters have, have a certain arc and certain things you pose certain questions and those questions get answered. Um, and unless you're, unless you're writing like a genre mystery series where the same detective comes back and solves a new crime each time, um, for the most part, that, that the very fact that the book has ended, if it's ended in a satisfactory way, suggests that you're done, you know? Um, and um, that was certainly the way I felt about, about Nobody's Fool for, for all those years, for all that time. Um, and then, of course, after after some after um, uh, after everybody's fool came out, then it wasn't a very long time at all before I decided to go back and 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 write this third book. But what happened? Why? Not so much why did I go back the third time, but why did I go back the second time? And the answer to that is actually um, um, pretty simple, although it contradicts just about everything I said about books that end in a satisfying way. 
Um, the reason to go back to the book that I probably shouldn't have gone back to or wouldn't have gone back to in, in any other situation um, was simply that I had based Sully on my father. Um, a lot of Sully's backstory as a war hero, um, the details of his, of, of his service during the war, um, what happened to him when he came, what happened to um, um, Sully when he came back from the war, uh, how his life proceeded. All of that was taken from, um, from my own parents' experience of, of, uh, of uh, my father's experience of the war and my mother's experience of him coming back from the war, a very different man who, who, who went over. Um, and um, um, uh, as, a, as a result of that, they split up. Um, I didn't see an awful lot of my father um, when I was growing up, despite the fact that he lived in the same small town that I did. I would sometimes be walking down Main Street and I'd see him standing outside the pool hall or, or outside the palace diner. And he'd be with some of his, he was always surrounded by friends. Um, and uh, he, one of his friends would nudge him and say, Jimmy, isn't that your kid? Uh, but that was about the, 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 for the most part, that was the extent of my, my uh, um, uh, acquaintance with the man um, until I, until at age 18, then back in New York, uh, at age 18, I became old enough to occupy the bar stool next to him. And uh, that changed everything. Of course, we became, uh, we became very close. We made up for lost time. Most years after I was, um, after I went to the University of Arizona, I would come back and we would work road construction together. Um, we became, um, I got, I got to know him. Um, and we became, we became very close. Um, but unfortunately it wasn't that long after all of that, that he became ill. Um, and of course he died before my first novel came out. Um, he knew I wanted to be a writer, but boy, there was no evidence that I would ever be one, <laughs> um, uh, certainly back then. But, but what I, but, 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 um, I think the reason, the reason that, um, that I went back to, uh, to Sully and to Nobody's Fool and that, that entire crew was simply that I discovered that, I, that by writing that book, I could spend more time with him. You know, um, I, I found that, that, um, first and foremost, alive, um, he was, a just wonderfully entertaining man. He was, to use one of his own favorite expressions, uh, full of more shit than a Christmas goose. Um, and and it, those those years that I was working road constructions construction with him and sitting on the next bar stool um, were uh, were wonderful. We made up for a, a fair amount of lost time, but I still ended up feeling like I got gypped, frankly, um, for for all those years that I didn't that I didn't really know him and wanted to. There's there was a kind of yearning that was going on there, knowing that he was close, but never, almost never getting to see him. Um, and going back and 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 writing the second Fool novel was just a, a just a, simply a chance to to spend more time with him and his friends. And of course, having learned that that I could do that, that I could resurrect him and and spend more time with him, once I realized I could do that, it wasn't very long before I wanted to do it again. So that's 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 why that's why this low hang this this novel with the low hanging fruit of of a title of somebody's fool. Um, um, that's how, that's how that came to be. Um, I don't know how to feel about the fact that it's, that it's over. Um, but the New York times headline, um, reassured me. Um, um, thank you for mentioning that, <laughs> that I had saved my best for last because, you know, a writer never knows, um, when, you know, you, you, you cross that boundary into, into, you know, um, self parody sometimes when writers begin to, when writers begin to lose it, the, I mean, we use our minds, all this, all of this comes out of our heads. And when our heads aren't functioning anymore, we are the last to know. And, and so it's, it was, it was lovely to hear that at least one reviewer felt that I was still, um, working at something like the top of my game anyway. And, um, um, so here we are, let's, um, Let's let's talk. Um, questions. Hi, thanks for coming. I really enjoyed your books. I just reread them because I just wanted to get ready to read this one again. <laughs> Thank um, you. You know, you you do you write so well about small town America, and with a lot of humor. And yet, small town America is really dying, and you see that in Empire Falls and all your books mm -hmm. and. And it's really a tragedy. And I, I wonder how that figures into your, your thinking about how to write about small town America, because 
I mean, I don't know. I've just been reading some of Wendell Berry's books, and, mm-hmm. and, and he he writes a lot about the tragedy of rural America. Yep. And um, I don't know. It's dying, and uh, and so. It's a big it's a big question. Um, it's a big question with, I fear, a longer answer than I can than I can provide here tonight. Um, I, you know, I came to I came to writing about my small towns. Um, um, not so much because I was interested in small towns themselves. Um, um, although I I finally did learn that that that. That since that's where where I was from, it was likely some part of me was located there too, uh, and so eventually I would find my way there. But the reason that I started writing about small towns wasn't even that I knew so much about them or had so much experience of them as a kid. Was that I had learned when I was learning when I was when I was trying to become a writer. Um, I learned that one of the things that I was most interested in, even more interested in than I was in than I was in place is that I was interested in class, um, which is another, of course, enormous feature of, of small town living. But what writing about places like Mohawk and North Bath um, did for me was that um, it allowed me a landscape in which the person with the most money and power and influence would cross paths on an almost daily basis with people who had next to nothing, right? Um, it's very difficult to do that if you're writing about a big city. I remember when my daughter Emily moved to um, um, to Brooklyn. She got her first job um, uh, in uh, in New York, and she found a she found a place in 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 Brooklyn, and she was working for a publisher. Or she might have been working for my agent back then, but she would come into New York on the on the F train and return on the F train, and she noticed. She noticed that, especially on the way home, on the F train, uh, which goes through Manhattan and then over into Brooklyn and then into the farthest reaches of, of Brooklyn, she began to realize that she could tell who was going to get off on which stops. You could tell she could tell by the the way they were dressed, um, um, and how old they were at the where at her at her stop. People that looked just like her all got off, you know, because they all they were all there for the same reason. They had a certain amount of money, a certain amount of education, a certain amount of all the ways in which we all select where we live. Which which is problematic, I think, for um, um, if you're if you're interested in class and you're writing about a place like New York or Washington, um, it's it's problematic because you've set up a situation in which a lot of the characters that you would that you would want to include in your story, it's very difficult for them to get together. Whereas Mrs. Whiting, who basically owns Empire Falls, um, um, crosses paths with somebody like John Voss, who is the shooter uh, in that book, on a fairly daily basis. And so if you're interested, as I am, in the haves of the world and the have-nots of the world, and why the haves happen, happen to be haves, and why the have-nots happen to be have-nots, um, a small town is the is the perfect crucible for that. Um, and to return to to th- the intent of your question, um, I mean, what we're talking about now is 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 related to a lot of the conversations that we're having right now about education, about um, um, elite colleges and universities um, admitting certain kinds of people, and it and it. And it turns out now that since we know that, that race can't factor into um, 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 decisions about admissions in colleges and universities anymore, um, we've we, we learned that in that we we started looking at the data now and, and realized that that um, what determines who gets into the Harvards and the Amhersts and the Yales and the Stanfords of the world comes down to something pretty simple. It's just money, yeah. <laughs> you know those. Those people who have a lot of it, um, and um, um, and who have the ability to use to use that money and their children's in, in, in promoting their children's educational welfare, are able to um, reap the benefits of of, of that. But in, again, in a in a um, in a in a small town, you just have so much access um, to to all of that to investigate those kinds of things, 
Uh, and again, to return to to this book um, for uh, just just an, another minute, um, the conflict um, between um, um, my father when he came back from the war and my mother who had not been in the war but was waiting for the war to be over because she really believed that in the United States after, after winning the war that had to be won, that doors were going to fly open all over this country. That, that I know, <laughs> it's hard to say that with a straight face, that the country clubs were going to want to, were, were going to start um, um, opening their doors to people whose names ended in vowels uh, and, and um, um, and that there were going to be there were going to be great um, 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 opportunities for people like our family, both my father's family and my mother's family, um, uh, had never had before. And and in fact, of course, at least in one respect, she was right. Education did open um, did open its doors to a lot of people. Certainly, I mean, there was never any question any any question that I was going to go to college. She made that perfectly clear from the time I was probably three. Um, and she was going to go with you. But, and, she, and, she, and she went with me <laughs> just, to make, just to make sure I made it all the way. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, but that was the that was when my parents split up. I think it was because um, it was because my mother had a different vi had a different vision of America. What she thought was going to happen, what America was going to become after the Second World War. Um, she had a very she had plans. She was nothing if not aspirational. And, 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 and those plans were something my father simply could not abide because he did not share that, that, sense, of, that sense of optimism about all those doors flying open to people like us in our families. I'm sorry, that's a, that was a very long answer to, 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 to the question. It's got, it's got a lot of tentacles, doesn't it? Thank you. Thank you. What type Hi. of uh, writing are you now working on? And are you going to continue the trilogy and also the theme of small towns? All right, what am I working on now? Um, well, um, when the writer strike happened, um, I had, I think, three projects up and up and ready to up and ready to roll and i i and they're of course now until until the writer's strike gets settled they were uh, i think all three were mini series actually two of them were completely written and one was one was we only had the pilot done for but um um i was going to take a break actually from novel writing for for just a bit to to work on those but but now until the strike until the strike is settled those are those are all on respirators now <laughs> Um, so I, I really, whatever my plans were, um, uh, in, in that respect are probably, um, null and void for the, for the immediate future. Um, for the first time in my life, um, since I started writing novels, usually what, usually what happened when I finished a novel, I was, I would begin another the next day. I would never wait. Um, and the reason for that was that every novel I have ever written has disappointed me in some way because of certain really important choices that I've made. Some, I, I chose to write the book in the first person. When I finished The Risk Pool was a father-son story. When I wrote it in the first person, having done it, I, I realized about halfway through there were certain things I was never going to be able to get at because it was the kid's story. Um, it was first person narrative. That was the only eyes, the only sensibility we were going to see through. Hence, nobody's fool was born because then by using third person, I would be able to get into Sully's head um, and, and other people's heads. And I forget what, what it was with, with nobody's fool that there was something about nobody's fool that didn't, that I couldn't get because of those choices, a whole different set of choices that I had made. Um, and so, and, and, and my next, and my next book was then birthed as a result of whatever. And, and, and that's, I mean, that's the good news. That's the good news. If it, if you, if you write a book and it satisfies you completely, then, then you're, then you're really going back to square one. Um, but, but, um, now I find myself, um, um, I've never toured with a novel where I wasn't halfway through the next one. Um, so this is, this is completely, um, unknown, unknown territory. Um, one of the things that about the pandemic, um, though, 
um, was, you know, it, it wasn't entirely bad news for me to be told to go home and stay there, um, which I did. Um, and I've never gotten so much writing done. I wrote stories. I wrote essays. I've got a, I will have a book of essays coming out this time next year. Um, and I still, I still, I still feel the, the same joy, the same spark, the same, um, thrill, uh, of approaching characters, whether I'm writing for the screen or, or novels or, 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 or whatever. Um, so I'm, I'm sure that something, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that something will come up. There is another novel. I have just a germ. Of an of of an i of an idea right now that I'm waiting to see if it that seed begins to ferment or something. Um, but but as to the question of small towns, it's it's all I know. Um, so um, that will that will continue to be my focus. I'm sure whatever whatever the, whatever it is that is next, I'd love to tell you what it is. I'd love to know what it is. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hi. Thank you so much for coming to give this oh. speech. And so I guess we appreciate it and we'll, we'll forgive you for killing Scully. Um, <laughs> I, 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 heard a, I heard an interview with once where you said your novel's about fathers and sons. And I was curious how, if you write or think about Sully differently as you go through the different changes of fatherhood as your, as your kids got older and um, if it made you write or view Sully and I guess your own dad by extension differently as, as you went through the different stages. Um. You know, it's funny when I when I look back at these books now, um, I um, I don't think I, I think less of the books themselves than who I was when I wrote it. You know, um, I think when I wrote The Risk Pool, for instance, my father's my father's death was very fresh in my mind. I was still I was still very much grieving um, when I was when I was writing that when I was writing that book. Um, and I think you can just you can kind of sense that um, that um, that that loss and that sense of grief on on the page. Um, so that's so that's where I, and when I when I think about that book, that's what I think about was was not only was I a lot younger, but I was a lot more uh, inexperienced and and um, um, thinking. Uh, I, I I'm sure it changed the way I, I I thought about my own daughters who were very young then. And I was a very different man who wrote, um, who wrote Empire Falls, which I will always think of as an exercise in parental dread, um, because both of my daughters, uh, one was just beginning high school, the other was still in, um, in middle school. Um, and I remember that during that period when I was working on that book, my daughters had just come into that age, as, as young girls will, where they come home and they won't tell you they won't they won't tell you and your wife everything that went on in school that day and i remember kate my daughter my younger daughter kate in in particular i would um um i would sometimes i was the one that was usually home uh, when when the girls got got home from school and i remember seeing her turn the corner some days under that enormous backpack that she used to have and come up the street with a look on her face that i knew something terrible had happened but i also knew she wasn't going to tell me about it which which filled me with a kind of dread because and as a parent you get caught between that's ex you that's exactly what you want is for your kids to have a private life some place that you are that you your parent are not welcome but that opens the door to something terrible happened happening what if you had known maybe you could have prevented something so th so that book so th I, I will always think of that that book that way but what I guess I'm getting at here is that is that I is is that all of these books I think have had um, have had an effect on me as certainly as um, as a father certainly as a husband, um, um, uh, they my my children my wife God love them all um, they have um, they have had a lifetime. Of, of looking across the dinner table or the lunch table at me, carrying on with them a perfectly cogent conversation, but they've all come to understand that the, when they see a certain look on my face, that I'm working on the book, <laughs> you know, that I'm, I'm not really there. And um, so um, I, I I guess the I guess what I'm trying to say here is that these 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 books 
um, even when they're not terribly autobiographical, um, even when you're inventing nine tenths of of what of what happens um, in the book, they are just so bound up at the at the molecular level with uh, with the life that you're living and 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 um, um, and your and your family and what's going on. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And one theme that you write about so eloquently, as you've mentioned, is class. Uh, mm -hmm. And thank you again for not crossing the picket line and participating in the writer's strike. But on the subject of the writer's strike, in addition to the 15,000 screenwriters who are on strike, um, you know, workers at HarperCollins went on strike last mm -hmm. year for more than 100 days. And we have... Yeah young adults across the country who are questioning whether going into writing is something that's even worth pursuing and or publishing or publishing yeah. for that matter. What does this current moment of the industry mean to you? And second part of the question, do you have any kind of advice or thoughts that you would offer to somebody who would like to pursue writing? Thank you. Okay. Um, don't go away because I'm going to, if once I ask, once I answer the first part of that question, I'm going to need to re, you to remind me what the second, what the, what the just, other part Just was. answer the first part. There's people behind me. Well, no. we can begin with the strike and the changes that are going on in, 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 in publishing because those two things are, are certainly related. Um, uh, a writer friend of mine, um, novelist and screenwriter, Ron Curry, uh, and I, um, um, about three weeks ago, um, just took the bus down to New York and joined. I, we, we live. We live in Portland, and and if we lived in New York or L.A., we'd be on the picket lines every day. But we don't. We live in. We live in Portland. But we did go down. Um, certainly felt it was our duty to um, to be there. Um, the last strike. Um, the last writer's strike. Um, uh, my wife and I had a timeshare in New York, and I was able to go um, um, and picket an awful lot more during that because I had a place to sleep um, down um, down there. I remember in that in that case, I was I was picketing. I was actually picketing Stephen Colbert, uh, who who was absolutely wonderful. I mean, his, he was paying his writers really well um, and and sympathized with the strike, and he was sending down coffee and donuts and 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 and, and everything. So it was not a it was not a tough gig at all, but, um, but it's, it's a union. I would, but the reason I would never cross a picket line is just goes, goes back to, um, again, um, um, my days as a young man, when I was, when I was working on, uh, um, road construction with my, with my father, um, it was a union job. And, um, um, I still remember what I made per hour, um, $3 and 33 cents working as a, as a, as a union laborer in upstate New York. And at that time, $3 and 33 cents was, was, I was paid more the first day on the job when I didn't know a single thing about it. I was paid more than my grandfather was made, uh, than my grandfather was paid. And he was a skilled artisan, um, um, a glove cutter who wasn't using the machines that came in. He was he was using only his only his hands. He was a craftsman who had proved uh, who had he was an artist who had proved what he could do with a skin of leather. Um, and I and I will never forget that. Um, uh, and for the most part, the tanneries, the, the glove shops were not were not unionized. None of those people and and many of them, too, were were recent immigrants um, and. And and for them, a lot of you know, if if part of having a voice is being able to speak the language, and 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 a lot of and a lot of these people um, didn't have a voice for economic reasons, but just very literally didn't have a voice um, because because many of them were not native English speakers, um, and that they could be abused that way. The entire town could be abused that way, and I could walk and and through my father, who was a member of the laborers union, you couldn't just walk up and sign up. You had to you had to have a way to get in. And um, of course, my father's sponsorship was was uh, was part of the reason that I got in. And suddenly, you know, 18 years old, without an idea of of what was entailed in that job, except that it would it would involve picking up very heavy things and moving them somewhere else. But other than that, I did not know how to do that job. First day on the job, I had no idea what it was, and I was making more than my grandfather. So yeah, I don't cross picket lines. <laughs> Yeah, and it, it, not not only just because I think the I I believe the writers are right, um, and uh, but but no, it goes it goes back it goes deeper than that and and farther back. 
All right. Second part of the question then Scratch was the second question. Um, just really quick, just between the writer strike, the actor strike, the Harper Collins strike, this moment. Actually, Politics and Prose is the first union bookstore in DC. Yeah. Um Solid State Books actually just won yeah. their contract. If you can't tell, I work in the labor yeah. movement. Um well, I know you, you, you wanted moment, me to talk about why why would you become no, a writer this in moment, this moment like give you hope, like for the future of this industry at writ large. Well, I mean, if they can get the economics of it um worked out. I'm I'm very hopeful of 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 um, the future of um, film and television. Um, I mean, right now, frankly, the economics don't work, and it and it's because the model has changed um, since streaming. There's uh, um, the people on the other side are are, are not entirely the, the the argument they're making is is not entirely without merit because there there is now less money coming in because streaming has just disrupted the entire system. Writers are making far less money than they did, but also movie com um, the producers and movie companies are they're they're bringing in less money too for many of the same for many of the same reasons. So it's not like they don't have a leg to stand on. It's hard it's hard for them to make their case when people like Bob Iger are are coming home with uh, with with financial packages that are just eye popping. You know um, but that said, if, if, if a reasonable accommodation can be made, I'm very hopeful about screenwriting. One of the reasons that I, I'm, um, have gotten back into it. It was always just a side gig for me, a side hustle. Um, and the reason I'm more interested in doing it now is that since movies have become just the bailiwick of, you know, Marvel Studios, basically. Um, so much great writing is being done on television. Why would you not want to be part of that? And to your larger question, why would anyone want to be a writer at all? And this, it's always been precarious. There's never been a time um, if you wanted to be a writer, you could do almost anything else and make more money um, for, for the vast majority of people who do it. Um, and the reason we do it, I think, is that it's, it's, it's not a job. It's a calling. It's a vocation. Um, and um, there's still, um, if, 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 you feel the, if you feel the urge, nothing else is going to work. You're just going to, you're just going to, have, to, you're just going to have to do it even when the, even when the circumstances are, are fairly bleak as they are now. And if you get good at it and if you're lucky, and I have, and I have been very, very lucky, um, you get to you get to you get to live a life that among um, that is rewarding, but also actually just plain fun. It's full of joy. Um, why else? Why else would you do it? Thank you so much. Yep. Richard, we have time for this one last question. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Hi. 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 <laughs> um, I love being the person who has to lower the microphone. <laughs> um, it's my dad. My hey, dad. Hey, uh, that's that's all right. You're not alone in that. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually I wanted to to ask a question about Maine. My dad lives in Lincolnville. Mm -hmm. Um, and I I got introduced to your books because of Empire Falls. Like that came mm -hmm. out I think at the end of college for me, and it was mm -hmm. just an amazing book. You do such a great job at depicting small town life. Um. But Midcoast is so different from how you've depicted a lot of the small town, you know, the small mill towns and and has changed a lot. Mm -hmm. um, one of the big things that I think is also really interesting is kind of how you address women in a lot of your books. Mm -hmm. And especially in that area, I mean, you have really depressed areas in Midcoast and really, really wealthy areas in Midcoast. And I'm wondering if you've thought about, I guess I'm trying to articulate this. I'm anxious so that's all right <laughs> sorry <laughs> but i guess my question is have you thought about kind of addressing some of the class issues and and you know female dissatisfaction in the same way that you would, that you take on men i mean you sort of do an empire falls mm -hmm. by you know for sure and and i i could really relate to tick like for for example but yeah. i didn't know if you thought about exploring that more having a female protagonist and maybe doing something in midcoast yeah no it's it's that. it's an excellent it's an excellent question there are two things going on there that one one is um, the, the question of Maine and location and, 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 and the mid coast versus the coast versus the interior. Um, a lot of money up and down the coast, but the farther, the farther inland you get, uh, yeah. the, the, the less of that, the less of that, that there is. So there's the, there's the, there's the location and place question, um, that you're asking. And then also the question of, of, um, of, of particularly focusing, um, 
more on on um, women and their particular plight um, than than I have in previous books. And that's a that's a that's a very fair question and a very good question. I'll try to answer it as honestly as I can. Um, I think my first three novels, um, that is, Mohawk, The Risk Pool, uh, Nobody's Fool, and and maybe Straight Man, the one after that, um, were very um, not only male centric. The subject was really male misbehavior, right? That was that was that was the theme. Watching. Watching Sam Hall and Sully um, um, navigate navigate the world, um, and they're and they're just they're very male. <laughs> I don't know what else to say about it. Um, and at that point in at that point in my life when I was writing those, um, um, I'll just I just have to say that that um, um, I had been I had been observing that 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 behavior. Um, for about the last decade. And I knew it better than I knew anything else. And I think that's why those books on that subject were, um, were as they were, as they are, whatever they are, they're very, they're very, they're very male. They're very male centric. Um, Not completely. So, I mean, one of my favorite characters um, who is still playing a role in somebody's fool, despite the fact that she died at the end of nobody's fool is Miss Burrell. Um, and, um, she plays a, she plays a, she has a very ghostly presence in this book. And she's one of my favorite, she's one of my favorite characters. Um, in my, um, collection of stories, The Whore's Child, um, I actually had the chutzpah to, um, uh, to take the point of view of, a of a 70 year old Belgian nun, uh, <laughs> um, and of course, I did become seventy, but I'm but I'm but I'm never going to be Belgian, and I'm never going to be a nun. Uh, but but at some point, I think in my in at some point in my life, um, I looked around, um, and all the all the important people in my in my life were women. My wife, my daughters, my mother was still my my father was had died by that time, but my mother was still around and indeed living with us um, during um, during that time. And I think I think if you were to look at my books from from kind of book four on, you would see you would see more women, more women and more attention to um, to women. And in this book in particular, Ruth and Janie play major roles, as does um, Sharif Sharice in the in the Raymer plot. So I've become more adventurous. But as I think you probably realize. We're living in a time right now where there are an awful lot of people out there who are advising you to stay in your lane, right? Which is which is which is death to a writer because we live we live by our imaginations, but we also realize, or or if you're the, I think if you, um, what I always and this book also deals with race front and center in this book in a way that I have not before. But every time you tee up a subject like that. Um, um, uh, I think th- that the only solution to that and to people who believe you should not write about anything except what you yourself have lived and experienced, um, I, have, I have no use for that. That's taking a selfie, right? Uh, and I don't think what, that's, what we, that's what we want of literature. But I think that when we, when we get out of our lanes, as we have a responsibility to do, we also have to do that with a, with a kind of humility. Um, and so to go back to your question, um, with each book where I try to expand what I know and know well and have known well since I was a kid into, uh, into areas where I have to imagine more, I also have to, I also have to research more and I have to read more outside of, outside of my, my, um, you know, my, my sweet spot. Um, and in order to write this book, um, uh, I, I realized probably I was 100 pages into this book when George Floyd was murdered. And I was writing a book about two cops, um, two good cops, Raymer and Sharice. But I realized after George Floyd's murder that I could not tell, I could not write the book that I had intended to write without taking on, um, without taking on front and center the issue of black, what it feels like, 
right? Now, what business in the world do I have writing about what it feels like to be black? I mean, look at me, right? Um, and in order to do that, the first thing you have to do is summon a certain amount of humility um, and get to work. And I took, a, I took like six months during the pandemic and I read nothing but black and brown writers. Not because I was looking for anything in particular. I wasn't looking for information. I just wanted to, in order to write this book, I felt simply ill-equipped to do it without that kind of, without that kind of immersion. Um, and so to do what you're, what, to do what you're recommending that I would do with regard to Maine, since I've lived there now, and, and Maine has been very kind to me. That's, they're, they're, Maine is not always kind to writers from away who yeah. come in and, and, and write, and, and write books about, you know, their, um, their state and their, and their locale. But Maine has been incredibly kind and incredibly generous to me. Um, and what you're suggesting is that I pay some of that back, I think, and pay, and, and, and pay some additional attention. Um, but that's what it would involve is a lot of heavy lifting, but it's an excellent question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> really appreciate it. Are we going to sign some books? Yeah. Okay.